Hello, readers and writers. I am Anthony L. Manna, also known as Professor Grandpa Tonio, the book guy and the writing guy. Welcome to Writers on Writing, my podcast series of conversations with new and established authors. Today is International Day of Education, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Jessica Jones, an acclaimed educator who has taught in many schools and cultural venues. Jessica Jones is a visual artist, a published author of poetry and essays, and a highly regarded authority on Native American education and Native American literature. She has served as a teacher of grades five through 12 English, K through 12 art, and has taught on the Blackfeet Reservation with the Upward Bound Program at the University of Montana, and also the Flathead Indian Reservation in Lake County, Montana. As a poet, she served as writer in residence for the Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio, where she taught poetry workshops to students who visited the park's Environmental Education Center. She was also employed as writer in residence with Calcutta Mercy Hospital in Kolkata, India, where she wrote about the needs of women, children, and orphans in the slums and the red light district to help raise funds for medical care and schooling. I think that's so amazing, by the way. <laughs> as, an, as an educator, she is committed to helping students understand the suffering, resilience, and survival of Native peoples explored in Native American literature. And she does this by introducing teachers to sensitive approaches to reading and discussing Native American literature so as to avoid stereotypes. In 2019, Bitterroot, her debut book of poetry was published as an award winner with Finishing Line, Finishing Line Press in the New Women's Voices series. Bitter Root launched from the Wick Poetry Center in Ohio. And I'm happy to tell you that throughout our conversation, Jessica will read poems from Bitter Root. Currently, Jessica Jones is a faculty member at Kent State University on the Stark campus, where she engages her students in poetry, fiction, Native American literature, and writing courses that focus on diversity and social justice. Jessica, welcome. <laughs> it's so good to have you here. I, I really, I'm delighted to be talking, talking with you today about your life as a writer. You know, I've been, I, I've been studying you, if you want to put it that way. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and so it's been, it's been such a pleasure. I mean, the diversity of what you've done in your career is startling, and so um, I'm so happy to meet you, and uh, and to be talking talking to you today. So, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I'd like to begin by uh, by asking you how, in a sense, how how did this all happen? How did you become an advocate for, I should say, a passionate ally of Indian liter Indian education? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. I want to make sure I say that first because I'm as thrilled to be here with you as you sound to be with me. Um, I sure enjoyed our phone conversation a month or so ago, and I just couldn't wait for today to continue that conversation. Um, I know you've had a really diverse career yourself, so I just feel kind of honored to be here. Um, well, I guess... Um, First of all, I just love kids and always have. So even as a little girl, I knew I would want to be a teacher. Um, I remember by about fourth grade, I already had it in my head that, you know, I wanted that desk with the apple on it and the windows behind me and books around me and, and kids in my life and so forth. Um, but in addition to that, Indian education has in some way or shape or form always kind of woven through my life. Um, in high school, my sister and I spent um, a little bit of time, a couple different summers on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. Um, in college, it was always something that was kind of weaving through my studies and kind of on my radar. Um, and I was always interested in um, diverse, um, diversifying the canon, since I'm a, a writer and a reader and a teacher. Um, so I came to social justice education before I even knew what it was. You know, there wasn't really a name for it back when I was doing 
outreach at, at various schools and so forth. Um, and it wasn't until I went to graduate school and there was finally a program that specialized in what I wanted. Um, and I, I was like, yes, this is it. University of Montana has a program in Indian education. That's where I want to do my master's. And then from there, you know, went straight to the res. And, um, yeah. and that was yeah, that's an arrival. I mean, in a way, it's an arrival. And it's just so wonderful um, to hear you talk like that, because I know I, I don't know, at an early age, I felt like having grown up in, in, uh, in a family where we were, there was an immigrant, in a sense, my mother came from Italy, you know, and I, I always thought, let's be accepting. And let's be and I didn't really know also what to call it. But right. it was, you know, and, and when I got into graduate school, as you, all of a sudden, I thought, Oh, so this is what it is: social, social acceptance and diversity, and it just opened up like a, a blossom, you know. You, you, and speaking yeah. of which, you trained in a program called Indian Indian Education for All. Well, what is that all about, and and who can join a program like that? Sure. Um, so I think I, I'm excited. I think we're going to start seeing more of this um, curriculum and and push for this curriculum across the United States. Um, but I can speak specifically for the program in Montana. It's called Montana Indian Education for All. And um, the state of Montana is one of the only states in the country to require a certain percentage of the curriculum in K through 12 schools to represent native voices, native ways of knowing, indigenous ways of knowing, I should say, I-W-O-K is the acronym for indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and in Montana, it's 30%. So whether a teacher is teaching math, astronomy, reading, um, uh, social studies, it's expected that within those school districts, 30% of that curriculum has to um, integrate and center on um, indigenous ways of knowing. And so in graduate school, that was kind of part of the um, pedagogical training that I received. And then during summers, there were these wonderful um, month long workshops put on by the National um, uh, Writing Project, NWP. And, and there's a, most states have a, a state writing project. Um, so this was the Montana Writing Project. And the um, sort of premise of National Writing Project is that um, if teachers of writing are immersed in writing themselves and are allowed to experience it as beginners, they can be better teachers of writing. And so the wonderful thing about going to grad school at University of Montana is that their summer month-long institute was immersive in Indian education for all. So not only was I learning how to become a better teacher of writing and kind of being humbled on a daily basis and, you know, as an adult being forced to read my, you know, nascent poetry out loud when it was still raw, all these things that we make students do. In addition to that, we had um, inquiry projects into things like the boarding school era, for example, or place names, or um, the tightly knit, um, uh, I don't want to call it a boundary, um, kind of terrain between environmental education and Indian education for all and so forth. So one of those programs that I was involved in was, was that. The other was the, um, the, the graduate degree that I did. And then once I got into teaching on the res, um, most, most schools on reservation have certain um, Office of Public Instruction training days and so forth. So the school where I was called them tribal days. And in August every year, we were expected to attend anywhere from three to four days of training. And we'd be led by tribal elders. We'd learn, um, you know, kind of hands-on projects we could do with the kids and so forth. Um, but for other teachers who are interested in this, you don't have necessarily have to live in Montana or live on the res. Um, you can download materials from the Office of Public Instruction in, in Montana and in some other states. Um, there are also materials available through the Smithsonian. Um, you can go to uh, the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, and they have a wonderful program. Teachers can go over spring break or during summers. It's called, I think, 360, 360 degrees. Um, and it's kind of in collaboration with the museum itself. You can take workshops there, or I think during the pandemic, they have lots of Zoom types of things. Um, once you start digging around as an educator, you realize that I'm just talking about the tip of the iceberg. There's tons of materials out there. You just want to make sure that they are um, tribally approved. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, well, that's, wow. I, I have also been involved in Kent State University's 
uh, the writing project from Berkeley. Uh, we called it now National uh, Northern Ohio, Northeast Ohio writing project. Okay. And I wish I wish I had known this because you know we we tried to diversify as as much as we could, but now people are going to know this. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm also going to alert uh, the project, which I, I no longer work with, but I was co-directing it, you know, mm -hmm. that they can they can look for this and diversify in these ways. I mean, I think that diversity and social justice and social awareness is coming into its own in a way. I mean, I know I it's know. always there, but I yeah, I know. I know what you mean, that, that we can pray for it that uh, as a possibility for all students you know, to, to, to know about human diversity. Um, I, I, you, um, you obviously have committed yourself uh, to engender interest in Native American literature. What, what can you tell us about that commitment? Sure. Um, well, I'm very excited because right now I'm on full-time faculty at Kent State. This is my sixth year. Um, and this semester, I'm actually getting to teach a whole semester of just Native literature to a, a class oh. of um, upper, upper division students. You know, I'm just absolutely thrilled. Um, but prior to that, no matter what I was teaching, I was always trying to draw in things from the voices that have been left out of American literature whether that's African-American literature, Asian literature, native literature, whatever it is, trying to just kind of bring it in. Um, and I think, I think if I had any advice for other teachers out there, it would be to um, use some of their professional development to take these workshops, like I was just talking about, because um, no matter what field we're in, we can always widen our own perspective. And then there's this wonderful trickle down to our students. And I think that our own passion and, and excitement about being human and about having a fuller understanding of what it is to be human, it's contagious. And then our students get excited too. And if it's authentic and it's from the heart and they, they see a mentor modeling humility, a mentor who's willing to say, I didn't, I didn't know about this, I was wrong, or I'm still learning too, or wow, I'm, I'm surprised by this, or I don't know, but let's find out. You know, having that spirit of curiosity, I think that's where that um, uh, in, engendering of interest in diversity begins. Wonderful, yes. Well, I mean, what you just said, I think should be written a little bit in gold, because I mean, what the process you just talked about is wonderful for ever for all education and all educators. You know, I mean, it's it's engendering that 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 curiosity, which is uh, so precious um, for for all of us. Uh, and now, so so speaking of, you know, how you brought literature in, can you talk to us a little a little bit about some of the native books that you would recommend? Because I'm sure that there are folks who have little or even no knowledge of native of native authors. Okay, um, so on the screen here, I have um, a couple different slides that I'm going to just flash through. And um, as I talk about the slides, I can sort of read out a few of the titles for any listeners that would be interested. Um, and the first genre that I have here on screen is um, further reading for those interested in poetry. So some of the seminal sort of seed poetry of um, Native writers. And um, I'll just go kind of title by title. I think I'll start in the lower right-hand corner with Joy Harjo. She is actually our poet laureate right now. Um, I think she's in her second or third term. Um, she's our, our first native poet laureate. She's a strong female. Um, she's just absolutely a, a, a powerhouse. And I'm thrilled to say that she's gonna be our guest for the big read at Kent State campus um, on March 17th. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, she will be at the Wick Poetry Center. So anyone in Northeast Ohio who would like to hear her read, um, Joy Harjo is wonderful. This is her books. She had some horses. The big read on campus is American Sunrise. I would recommend her memoir, um, Crazy Brave, which I think I have on another slide. Another author to look up is N. Scott Mamaday. Oh, and I should say Joy Harjo is um, Muskogee Creek. Um, and Scott Mamaday is uh, an author from Kiowa country. Um, this is a, a kind of a lyric memoir. It's a combination of poetry and a little bit of storytelling. 
On the left, we have um, Sand Creek by Simon Ortiz, um, kind of a historical poetry document. Um, it's jarring, um, but for those interested in history, that's a, that's a good one. Um, on the upper left, we have Lucy Tapahanso. She's my personal favorite. Um, she's a Diné author from Navajo country. Um, the title of this one is The Women Are Singing. She has a couple different titles. Um, and I just love her work because it's so place-based. Um, she does incorporate some of her native language. The imagery is really rich. She really just takes you places with her. Top and center is Jimmy Santiago Baca, um, Black Mesa Poems. Um, he's a storyteller, but, but he tells his stories through poetry, almost like snapshots on the cover of the book. And then another favorite up here in the upper right, um, James Welch, uh, Montana native author. This is writing the Earth Boy 40. He's also a novelist. So if, if you look up James Welch, you're gonna find a, a host of, of various titles. Um, the next screen, further reading um, fiction. Uh, here we got uh, James Welch again, Fool's Crow, a historical novel. Um, Sweetgrass Basket, which the lower left right here, this is not a native author and it's very rare that I would recommend something not written by a native author. However, um, part of her family, I, th I think her husband's family um, was native and she did a ton of historical research into the boarding school era. And so it's, it's a really heartfelt lyric young adult novel um, written about that experience. And I think it's based on um, the journals of her husband's aunt. I, I think I'm getting that correctly. I'd have to look at it again, but, but it is legit. And I, I have seen it listed on native websites as a good read. Um, of course, Sherman Alexi, he's sort of like the, the um, groundbreaking native young adult writer. Um, this is called The Absolutely True Dyer of a Part-Time Indian. Some listeners might know that he's had some controversial issues in the news about um, harassment of women and so forth. I'm always really frank with my students and let them know that many, many authors in our canon from many, many different backgrounds have been called out for their behavior. Um, I, I will say that Sherman Alexi has um, come forward and, and he's been very forthright about his own recovery and so forth. He's a wonderful, brilliant writer, so I would still include him despite that. Um, they're there. This is um, a more contemporary writer, Tommy Orange, um, more about the urban, the young urban Indian experience. Um, upper right, we've got Louise Erdrich. Um, this is a wonderful novel called Love Medicine. There's just uh, nugget after nugget of wisdom in, in that story. And front and center, um, groundbreaking, absolutely earth shattering ceremony um, by Leslie Marmon Silco. Um, kind, of a, kind of a thick read, um, but very important if you're interested in, in the um, genre of native lit. Um, the next screen here, this is philosophy and indigenous, indigenous ways of knowing. I only have four titles here because I'm really more of a literature teacher, but um, indigenous ways of knowing are inseparable from native lit. So it's important to at least read something. Um, Upper left, we've got Vine Deloria with um, God is Red, a Native View of Religion. Upper right, we've got Power and Place in Indian Education in America by Vine Deloria and Daniel Wildcat. Um, they're two of my favorites. I really, really enjoy the way they conversationalize in their writing. Um, Every Day is a Good Day, Wilma Mankiller. Um, and this is actually an edited collection um, with lots of different women in there from various backgrounds, not all um, writers necessarily. So like there are some painters in there, um, some leaders and so forth. Really a great read for young women, I think. And then on the lower right, we've got Linda Hogan with um, Dwellings, A Spiritual History of the Living World. Um, and then for those who teach children, um, some resources for responsible reading, um, a website you might look up right here. Um, it's spelled O-Y-A-T-E, and I believe it's just oyate.org. And they have list after list of um, resources that have been tribally approved, looked at by elders and so forth. And they also have advice on books to avoid. Um, and then same thing down here, um, ancestor and approved intertribal stories for kids, um, kind of a little link to the HarperCollins website um, with a collection here. So I'll come out of screen share and come back to you, Anthony. I know that's a lot of information. Yes. Oh, that was terrific. Thank you very much. You just, you, 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 there's a rainbow there, <laughs> you know. And uh, yes, and I, I, I've seen too that for children and young adult literature, which I spend a lot of time with, uh, even in my retirement, 
that I'm so happy to see Harper Collins set up their Native American uh, trade, you know, and uh, it's so good to see it. And uh, I, I, I've, I've discovered um, Cynthia Leetich. Is that the way Cynthia Leetich Smith? I think uh, so. She does. She does a lot of YA, you know, and and it's 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 good stuff. I'm just so happy because I mean it's true. I would have to say I knew very little, you know, and I'm just I'm everything is a gem because I'm learning so much uh, from from these writers, you know. Um, I, now I, I turn to your resume, and I was struck by the wealth of experience you've had teaching Native literature. Um, I'm just wondering about your guide. Our, our listeners and viewers would would benefit from your guidance for reading and exploring Native literature with, say, children and and, uh, and teens. I mean, I know you teach at the university level too, so go ahead. You know, wherever you want to go. But sure. what do you recommend? You know. Yep. I actually um, I'm going to do another screen share here because I have a um, kind of a, a guideline that I share with. Um, when I do um, workshops for teaching teachers. Um, so if we have a few minutes, I'd like to just kind of walk through this, if that's all right with you, Anthony. Sure. Can you see it okay? Yes, sure. Okay, great. I can see it, yes, I can see it. It's, it's, it's very vivid. Okay, um, so this is a handout I, I give at workshops. I give it in my um, college classes with my students. Sometimes when I teach Summer Upward Bound, I'll, I'll give it out to my high school kids, even though they themselves live on a reservation, they're from the res. Sometimes, you know, it's important that we just open the dialogue. It's almost like the inclusion of land acknowledgements these days, which are really, really important, but they're just a doorway. So I kind of use this um, list of guidelines as a doorway. The first point um, that I like to talk about is that we have to realize indigenous cultures are land-based. So nature, place, religion, and language are often inseparable. Um, indigenous languages often contain wisdoms that people who come in from the outside and don't speak that language as a first language are not gonna understand because they are tied to places or they are tied to things that happened in certain locations or there's um, references to nature that um, are very, very specific to culture and so forth. So we have to realize that um, these, these cultures are land-based and that many of these groups have been forced out of their homelands, which continues to cause loss in every aspect of life. Um, when we read indigenous literature, we're gonna see evidence of this here and there. And if we don't understand this, this point, um, that might be lost on us. Um, the next point is to accept that many indigenous cultures are primarily oral meaning that stories, verse, song, wisdom, ways of knowing are passed from one generation to the next, not necessarily with a written component. Some do, some have not, some have come to this later, um, but because of the complicated nature of colonialism, there can be a deep distrust of the written word. Um, and sometimes that comes into play within literature itself. And there might be deep, deep ironies of the written word. Um, we also have to be aware that commonly accepted standards of European and Caucasian American canons might not apply. Um, so it's important that we conduct research to explore the expectations and the aesthetics within the given tribe or the region that we're studying. So for example, if we were to um, go in and look at early native songs, their standards of beauty are conciseness, short line length, repetition, um, nature imagery, that, such as water or the wind or um, birds, things like this. And there's an implication that the audience hearing the song is a part of that cultural group and that they will understand what's being said. If we were to take, let's say, a, um, an Ojibwe song from around the year 1500 and place it next to a Shakespearean sonnet, or Elizabethan English. Folks in Elizabethan England are not going to think that this beautiful Ojibwe love song or song about nature is up to par, right? Because it's not written in like rhyming couplets, it's not iambic pentameter, it doesn't have this complex psychological, you know, depth to it, this whole sort of Shakespearean element. And likewise, um, probably the Ojibwe audience is going to think, 
this, this is bizarre. This Shakespeare dude is off his rocker, you know? So we have to, we have to really kind of immerse ourselves in the expectations and the aesthetics of the tribe, of the time period, of the literature that we're studying. Otherwise, we, we might think that something is unappealing without realizing that it's actually quite appealing or masterful in the culture that we're looking at. Uh, the next bullet point is to avoid sweeping generalizations. No one author in any tradition from any race, class, gender, age, culture can be expected to represent his, her, or their culture, their race, their religion, their gender perspective, etc. cetera. Um, we always want to avoid those generalizations and acknowledge that I cannot represent every, you know, middle-aged female from Northeast Ohio, <laughs> you know, we're going to be diverse within any group. Um, so along with that, we want to be tribally specific. North America alone, that's not even looking at South America or Australia or New Zealand, um, has hundreds of diverse, highly unique indigenous tribes with distinct languages, distinct religion, um, and culture that are very much alive today. Uh, it's not a thing of the past. So we want to be respectful of these differences and not speak of indigenous life as something that's over. We don't want to um, assume that like, you know, the cowboys and Indians time period is something that happened in the past and it's done. Um, next bullet point, we want to understand that much indigenous culture has been erased, um, has been oppressed, illegalized um, up until the 1970s. Native religions across the US were not legal. Um, there have been lots of issues with um, um, the ability of families to legally keep their children. Um, there's just layer after layer of, of difficulty when it comes to laws and um, Native life in, in the US. Um, indigenous culture has been marginalized, stereotyped, appropriated, stolen, tokenized, romanticized, mysticized throughout history. And these erasures permeate American understandings of, quote, the Indian. And then they therefore manifest in books, in film, um, in fashion, sports, psychology, new age spiritual movements, and even in academic conversation. Um, so we need to always kind of be alert to those and be willing to open it up a little bit, unpack it, talk to each other, try to take it apart and have a multi-story narrative to overcome these stereotypes. Um, this one's important when it comes to buying literature for um, classrooms, especially, or for the young people in our lives. We want to avoid buying literature that's written from the first person perspective of non-Indigenous authors imagining to be or recounting fictional accounts as though they themselves are Native American. Instead, we want to turn to those websites that I just offered to kind of help screen out those non-legitimate texts. If possible, we always want to have, you know, if we're doing a first-person narrative, we want to have that narrative told from the lens of someone who has walked in those shoes. Now, that's not to, um, extricate or to ostracize witness literature, that's different. Um, we can still incorporate witness literature into the braid of, of what we read, but we want to acknowledge that it is, it is something different. It's from another perspective. Um, this is something more for probably college kids and adult writers, but um, it's important to familiarize ourselves with the basic outline of federal policies looking back over the last 500 years. And this goes back to what I mentioned early on. These can be found through the OPI, the Office of Public Instruction. Um, Montana offers these and they're called the Essential Understandings Regarding Montana Indians. And there's wonderful printable um, documents. They're easy to hold, they're easy to flip through. They're very simple if you just kind of read the bullet points. And it helps us understand what has happened um, from 1491 until now and the federal policies that have kind of guided and, and formed um, how we have ended up where we are today. And then the last two, we want to be prepared for indigenous perspectives in literature to contrast sometimes. And sometimes that contrast is sharply um, in, in sharp contrast with each other or in sharp contrast with perspectives commonly told by the mainstream. Therefore, we want to always embrace the wideness of indigenous literature and its many, many subgenres. Um, the, the, PowerPoint slides I showed a few moments ago, those are just a few of the genres. I mean, I just covered uh, some philosophy, fiction, and poetry, but 
there's much beyond that. There's sci-fi, there's thriller, there's um, detective novels and, and so on and so forth. So there are always young voices continuing to contribute um, fresh perspectives. And there are older voices that are continuing to gain presence because they're being kind of discovered or rediscovered within our ever widening American canon. Wonderful. So very illuminating. Thank you so much. I mean, again, it's like, in a sense, it's almost humbling. Because, and I like that. I like that because it means that I'm on the verge of knowing, learning, you know, and um, I think it's, uh, it's just incredibly uh, rich. I'm so glad that you're talking to us. I read a statement you made about your commitment, and this is a quote, to help students understand the depth of understanding and survivance often present in native literature. So what do you do to encourage students to take heart to the injustices and indignities indigenous people have endured in the past. And I think the thing that I like very much about what you're talking about is that it's, it, it's not only the past, we get that impression that it's, a, it's a, 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 a cowboy and Indian movie and it happened in the West and it's all over, you know? Um, right. So, you know, what do you do? Right. Um, you know, there's a really good um, book out there called Rethinking Columbus for Teachers. Um, it's put out by an organization called Rethinking Schools. They're in, I think, Minnesota. And they offer some pretty cool exercises in there to do with classes um, or the kids in your life to think about um, or to experience sort of uh, micro versions of injustice and therefore think about empathy. What's it like when um, someone walks up to my desk and just kind of digs through my purse and says, this is mine and walks away. We can yeah. give these kind of scenarios to help kids think, well, they can't do that. That's my purse. But this is what happens when, when land bases are stolen from conquerors worldwide, not just in the U S you know, someone kind of can come up and say, well, this is my purse now. This is my land. Now I'm in charge. I get the contents of this, you know, so I always try to look for organizations that offer um, books I can read that have ready to go lesson plans, um, empathy exercises in empathy and, and things like that. And I just, honestly, I think the act of reading itself engenders empathy. I know there are studies out there that talk about compassion and how reading about fictional characters allows young children to kind of walk in somebody else's shoes and, Ex expands the mind to consider what other experiences are like. Um, yeah, I think yeah. some of those things. Absolutely. And uh, again, it's the awakening, you know, it's an illumination all over the place. Now I'd like you to read one of your poems. And so I, I said, you know, boarding schools, which I love, or marginalia. Yeah. Which, or reflecting some of the things you've been talking about. Yeah, I thought about this and I decided for this morning that I think I'll read boarding schools because we've been um, kind of touching on on some of the historical moments, but not really diving into them. And I think this poem for readers who are open to it allows some of that empathy to grow. Um, and it also hits on this term of survivance, which is a term coined by Gerald Visner, a Nishinaabe author. Um, and I love this term because it doesn't really pin it down. It forces those of us thinking about this term to kind of dance around it. The idea that survivance isn't survival, yeah. it's also not celebration. It's just this kind of mix of like resilience and having come through suffering and, and we're still here. Um, so I don't mention that term in here, but um, the fact that the poem contains um, the history of boarding schools as well as some of the survivors of boarding schools points to that. Um, so um, this is called Boarding Schools. At the Indian Ed Conference, Crow Agency, the gallery is lined with photos. Sue, Cheyenne, Pawnee children as young as five years old, forced to leave their families, not given back until 18, taught American skills, industrial arts useless on the plains. Inuit children hauled to Pennsylvania, Navajo, Little Shell, Blackfeet, forced to strip their clothes, erase their names, learn the same foreign tongue. I can't stop staring at one photo, 
titled Boys and Girls in Back of Mission Truck, 1928, Children Coming from Cut Bank Boarding School. 24 kids crowded in coats, hats, their faces achingly familiar. They could be Noah, Anicia, Kamii, Cree, big eyes, soft cheeks, the same dimpled fingers that trace the desks in my room each morning. It was not until 1978, the presenter's voice floats between didactics, that Native American parents gained the right to deny their children's placement in off-reservation schools. A man behind me is telling a woman they cut off his braids, beat his knuckles, how he carried a sliver of soap in his pocket, forced to eat it when he slipped into crow, that everyone, even his friends, said, don't speak, don't speak don't speak. Wow. God, it's so, so moving. Oof. You know, I mean, I read that, but then to have you read it to me, it takes on a whole different aura, you know, and the, the uh, survivance, yeah. you know, and the suffering and the, the, the you know, you just, just sometimes can't believe what we do to one another. It's true, isn't it? Yeah, well, you, you, I think you meant, you, you, you addressed this next one, and so if you want to skip over it, I can understand, but I asked you here that uh, in what ways will students or anyone's uh, understanding of aspects of Native American history make them sensitive readers of Native American literature? And I thought you went through that with your, your list there, but you may want to, you know, mention a few things here. I feel like I covered it, but you know, there is some, there's one little anecdote that I, I would like to share with you because I think you'll relate to this having been a literature professor yourself. I was at a, um, a, uh, an English club meeting a couple of years ago and this wonderful colleague of mine who taught African-American literature did an exercise with us. It was, you know, a couple of faculty members, the students, and she's sitting there and, and she holds up, she was going to do a, a talk on African-American lit. She holds up a book and she says, um, it was Harry Potter. She says, what genre is this? And we all say, oh, young adult lit. She holds up uh, Louisa May Alcott, what genre is this? And Emily Dickinson. And we all said, oh, women's lit. She holds up Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison. And we say African-American lit. And she, she holds up Walt Whitman and says, what genre is this? And we all go, it's just American <laughs> literature. <laughs> right? And it just hit me like a ton of bricks, how important it is that we get the frameworks we need for the literatures that have been marginalized, because we can't just walk into Holocaust lit and not teach ourselves and our kids about Kristallnacht or, or the ghetto or the Gestapo or whatever, like we need, we need those frameworks. And we need those frameworks for native lit as well. Well, wow. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're in a real controversy about this in the States right now with so many politicians talking to us that they don't want us to teach the um, survivance. They don't want us to teach the, uh, the, the struggle, the suffering, you know, uh, because we'll feel guilty. Uh, and uh, it's, pretty, in, in, it's pretty amazing, I think, that we're in that, that paradigm that needs to be needs to shift or i think people like you or me or other literature teachers can rise up and say no that's not the way it works it sensitizes yep. you know so not and guilt, so, guilt doesn't serve us no right? it's moving through that moving towards action that that gets right up. right and i mean if they read enough some of these politicians would read enough they would mm -hmm. see that it's an opening it's an opening to human understanding and human sensitivity you know, yeah. so yeah, with the movement, what is the movement called? I'm slipping past that, um, that, you know, I, I, it'll come back to me, but I mean, it's, it's definitely an expression that people are using um, to avoid uh, cultures. Hmm. You know? I'm not sure. There's so many terms flying around out there. My students are always teaching me new things that I haven't caught. <laughs> so when you, when you talk about, and I think also you've, you've mentioned this a little bit, but the, when you when you think about Native American stereotypes, which ones do you do you think we need to challenge and and also obliterate, avoid, whatever? Mm -hmm. I think it's so important that we um, talk about mascots. Uh, mascots are a problem. They're so dehumanizing. Um, studies show that they're terrible for self-esteem. 
for Native kids that are in schools that still use Native mascots. Um, the more students are exposed to things like that, the less um, sense of community there is in, in a school or, a, or in a neighborhood or whatever. So I think it's important to look at mascots. Um, I think it's important to not put any culture on a pedestal. Oftentimes there is this mysticization, you know, um, when I lived out West, my former partner and I um, did foster care and had native kids and, and he himself is indigenous and so forth. And oftentimes I, you know, if I was maybe back home or I was traveling and, and that would come up in conversation, people would say to me, that's so cool. And I'd look at them like, these, these are my loved ones. I don't, I don't think you realize what it, what it feels like to, to, to be seen as though you're in like a glass cage, a, an exotic zoo animal. And that's what that does. It dehumanizes. So I think that if we can continue to open these dialogues about things like mysticizing cultures, putting mascots on cultures and so forth, then we can dismantle them. Um, there's a wonderful, this is the last thing I, I'll say on this question, but there's a wonderful TED talk by an African woman. Um, she's from Nigeria. Her name is Chimamanda Adichie. She's a novelist and it's called The Danger of the Single Story Narrative. And in this TED talk, she kind of um, unpacks this notion that if we only tell one story about a culture, we are flattening it out for all of us and we're losing out on a celebration of the human spirit. Um, and I won't tell all her stories because they're hers, you know, but um, what she realized was that as a Nigerian woman, she was practicing stereotypes within the sort of the class levels in her culture. And then when she came to America to be a student, her roommates were stereotyping her based on what they thought it was to be African. And at the time, there was not literature written from Nigeria that represented who she was you know, growing up as a little girl. All the literature she read was about blue-eyed girls with blonde hair, you know, in England, eating apples and drinking tea and so forth. And she says that we've got to have multiple story narratives. This is how we're going to overcome stereotypes because stereotypes endanger us all. Yeah, and, and I think um, Haaland, the new, uh, she's oh, yeah, in, definitely. in government. Yep. Uh, to protect, you know, she's talking about, she's also talking about mascots, but she's also talking about some of the language, some of the, the squaw language and the, you know, and how it's demeaning in so many ways. Um, and I, I mean, she's outspoken, which I think is what we need to hear. You know, we have a common, a commonality here. I, I, I mentioned that here you are teaching on the flat, flathead reservation. And I was once invited to teach children, a children's literature course of all things, to teachers and the support staff on a Passamaquoddy reservation in Northern Maine. And, you know, I worried about it. Uh, would I be, I, I'm a non-native, would I be accepted? Would I be welcomed? And, and I say to you here, yes, I was warmly welcomed. So what about your experiences as a non-native on the res? Yeah. Um... I have always had such positive experiences and I realize part of that is probably um, invisible privilege that I don't realize. Um, I think that oftentimes female teachers are welcomed in a little bit more because we're seen as being nurturing and so forth. I was young when I first started and so I think that probably also helped. But, you know, I think that um, approaching things humbly helps as well. And I knew that I was, um, we're all on native land, no matter where we are, but I was on native land that had been kept as native land and so forth. And so I, I really kind of came in with my heart open because I wanted to work with kids. Um, and in, in a couple of the communities that I worked in, they're small towns, you know, Montana at, at the time is getting more populated, but it's still sparsely populated. And one of the towns had like 1200 people in it. And so there's this funny story I always like to tell. I had just been hired as a sixth grade teacher and I did not know this yet, but 
my picture was in the newspaper with my name under it. You know, this is our new sixth grade teacher and so on. So for like a week, I'm, I'm going to the grocery store, the gas station, whatever. People are waving at me. People are saying, hi, Miss Jones, you know, and, and I, it took me forever to figure out like, oh, like, this is, this is small town, rural America. You know, they're going to know who I am. There was no privacy, but I just, I loved it. And I think um, in towns like that, whether it's a reservation or not, the town, the school is, is kind of the centerpiece of town. And so I'd have my, you know, 730 in the morning arrival at school. I'd get done with doing after school detention or whatever at 430. But then in the gym, there's an auction or a basketball game or the girls volleyball team or a powwow or a community dinner. So I'd be at school all day because there's stuff going on and you get to know people that way. I mean, I remember coming home to Ohio for Christmas one year and my mom and I were in a grocery store and I looked at her and I said, this is so weird. I'm, I'm in a grocery store. There's got to be a hundred people in here. And I don't know a single one of them. <laughs> right. so, yeah. So I, I, I felt warmly welcomed, you know. Um, yeah. And I, and I, I, when I was reading about you and being on the reservation, I remember the, the sincere, I mean, people were reaching out to me, you know, yeah. and, uh, I was, I just felt so honored, you know, and then there were, there were some of the older women, and I don't want to romanticize this, by the way, but some of the older women were best, they were basket weaving, oh, yeah. and they were sitting there listening to me, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I, I was watching them and just so appreciative that they were bringing part of their culture to me, yep. you know, and, and the snacks as well, et cetera, on we go. Your mm -hmm. poem, Valentine's Day or oh, North sure. Star, um let us go forth again and this is beautiful stuff and so whatever which one you decide yeah i thought that i would do valentine's day because it does really speak to um the wonderful sense of of interconnection that i felt um being a sixth grade teacher and this is this is on the flathead reservation um so valentine's dance and we're, we're coming up on february so i guess this is timely such a flurry, the day of a dance. Snow is still blue, dark at my window when they trickle in. Who's going? And what are you wearing, Miss Jones? That skirt? I like its roses. Bridger eyeing my ankles as I hang his pink paper chain above our door. By noon, my desk overflows. Carnations, cupcakes, caramels, and a heart-shaped tin. Lunch apples, even a lemon from someone's kitchen. The empty-handed lure cookies from dark pockets give me eraserless pencils. When the bell rings, we race home. By seven, return to fill a darkened gym. Billy Joe paces in black shirt, red tie. Girls float by in white dresses. The shy ones huddle, beginning unfinished sentences while their eyes dart about. We teachers are shocked. A $3 ticket and Friday night ride? Too much for most. But here they are, busting the disco, the windshield wiper, the swim, and some other move I can only call the flop. In a dark corner, even my quietest boy, giving it up to the arms flying head down all out cross country ski. Such a, I mean, connection, <laughs> please. <laughs> you, you start off by saying the interconnection or something, you use an expression, interrelatedness. And I mean, how beautiful for you to, to see, to, to, for those images, for you to mine those images, you know, and present them to us. Um, uh, your your role, many roles as a teacher. You once taught visual arts. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I should point out that you, you are a professional artist. You've exhibited, and our listeners will find an exhibit of some of your some of your art on your website. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I I like how you set that up. I was intrigued. When teaching art to young students, what do you do to, or what do you hope they'll learn when you engage them in art activities? And I just happened to mention one, which is. Uh, intriguing to me, which is the flying, the flying creature lesson. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> the, and the photographs, you know, your the our viewers and listeners should know that if they they're they're going to see um lots of photographs of you working with kids and that's very endearing but also very uplifting, you know. So so what about this the flying creature lesson or whatever lesson you want to choose? Sure, yeah. Um 
I love teaching art and I always feel lucky during summers if I get assigned to teach art history to my upward bound kids because then I get to do hands on things to go with it and so forth, you know. Uh, the flying creature was a lot of fun that was a summer in Missoula um, with Missoula public schools, just kind of a summer camp thing and I was trying to think of a way to. Um, help the kids think outside the box because if you and I had to do a 3D assignment and you know oftentimes by the these were third graders fourth graders by the time they reach third and fourth grade they're already starting to learn what the rules are you know where reality starts and the imagination stops and so forth and so I decided to have them make paper mache um, animals of some sort but no matter what animal they chose it had to have wings and if they didn't want to use an animal that already existed, they could make one up. And we had feathers and colored tissue paper and glitter. And I mean, I'm sure the janitor just hated my classroom at the end of the day. <laughs> um, but I, I think that my goal in, in any classroom, not just visual art, is to um, hopefully help students feel like they're safe enough to make mistakes that they can explore things and break rules so that they better understand what the rules are and why they're there or why maybe they shouldn't be there and to get into that zone to realize that there's something kind of larger than ourselves when it comes to creativity and if we just open ourselves to that channel it's going to flow through us you know clay and paint and all these wonderful things allow students to get into that mode of um, creating Beautiful. Yeah. And then, and then the permission, you know, in a sense, I mean, I hate to put it that way, but I mean, sometimes I think they feel that, that they're, they're being allowed or permitted and it's mm -hmm. what an opening that is. Mm -hmm. Another of your poems, Field sure. Trip. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Field Trip. Um, let's see. I didn't mark that page. So give me just a moment. It's on page seven. Oh, good. You did do your homework. <laughs> Oh, this was a fun day. It's always fun for me to read these because it kind of brings me back to the moment. Um, and we had, the students and I had done a, uh, a little project. They weren't flying creatures, but we did fish mobiles that were um, part of this unit on looking at uh, species in Montana. So this is called Field Trip. The sixth graders tried to fish kicking horse, which is a reservoir. While grown-ups assembled rods, doled out line, hooked worms, kids were each to cast twice. But Will dropped his meds in the gravel. Cheyenne lost her glasses. Everyone wanted sunscreen. Jaslyn slipped in the mud. The outhouse was a hike. When the buses rolled in too soon, Mr. Valor got so mad the students were scared to board. Returned to the shade of my classroom with chairs stacked and 20 minutes to kill, we hung our trout mobiles from the ceiling, then played a game of metaphors. Just as the bell rang, Elijah shouted, Miss Jones has more curves than a racetrack, and darted, leaving me in sudden quiet under a school of paper fish, their colored fins gently swimming in and out, so very soundless. Oh, gosh. Hold on to that image. It will keep you sustained for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what they leave behind sometimes is so much more important than yeah. what we went through you know because it's the, the wonderful memory um, I, i'd like to i'd like to turn to the cuyahoga valley national park which yeah. is so close to my residence here and yeah. your residency there mm -hmm. and i say you know uh, a, a valuable strategy for inspiring young writers but you have so much so you know whatever you want to choose from there i think is um Mm -hmm. you know, and then I, you know, that I think it will be worthwhile to all of us. And then I asked you to read a few of the poems your young residency writers wrote. Yeah. So um, in 2000, 2000, 2007 to eight, for a full 12 months, I got to live in the Cuyahoga Valley and um, live in one of the park properties and kind of hike around with elementary and middle school kids that came through to camp for three or four days. They would live in the, uh, not camp, they would be in the dormitories and they would attend um, uh, a nature camp at the environmental center. And so it was my job to tromp through the woods with them and write poetry. And what was wonderful about this was that the woods themselves were the classroom. And so all I really had to do was get the kids to tune into their five senses. Mm -hmm. 
And that's still kind of a tactic I take even with my college students. We'll go out, we'll write haikus, we'll um, you know, listen, we'll kind of go through each of the senses. Um, and I ended up eventually writing an, an essay about that experience of spending a year in the woods with kids. Um, and it's, it's called Press Your Ear to the Whispering Branch, Deep Listening in the English Classroom. It's published in j for any teachers or scholars out there who might want to look it up. Um, but this is an excerpt from that essay um, that contains bits of the children's poetry. So I'm just going to read a little, little tidbit here. Um, um, oh, and before I read it, I should say I broke the essay into five parts. Um, the idea that when we spend time in, in nature and do deep listening with children, and even as an adult, as adults, several things occur. We're able to access stillness. Um, we can have greater self-knowledge. We experience a sense of wonder of the nature around us. Um, we can access playfulness and humor. And we also have a greater awareness of our interconnection with each other and with the natural world. So this is in the, the section of the essay called Awareness of Interconnection. One day after a particularly successful workshop, I was tramping through the woods and fell in behind three boys. They were discussing the poetry they had just written. No, no, man, that one wasn't mine. Mine was the flower, I heard one of them say. Who wrote about the wind? I don't know, she didn't say. Mine was the button. The bachelor button? Yeah, read it again, man, I didn't hear it. The boy unrolled the paper in his fist and read as he scuffed through the leaves. Bachelor buttons are beautiful, I think you would agree. The puddles of their centers staring up at me. The middle of this flower looks like a cat's claw, open and pointed inward like a shark's jaw. That's sweet, man, that's tight. And then they kind of continue tromping through the woods. <laughs> um, so I think uh, for any teacher of writing, whether it's with kids or with college kids, um, getting them to just listen to the world and use their five senses, things are gonna happen. Well, that essay, which I read, of course, is, uh, again, it's, 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 a, it's a methodology, you know, in a sense, I mean, for, uh, for a, a new teacher, a, a veteran teacher to, to reawaken to the possibility of what you can lead kids to uh, when, you, when you guide them uh, in, a, in, a, in any environment, really, but I mean, particularly in nature, that's so, so wonderful to hear. You, you so, and then all, now we turn to you as the professor. <laughs> yeah. You're, Nate, you, here you are, Kent State University, and I'm assuming that, that a full semester of, of creative writing, uh, pro lessons, projects, etc., cetera, um, as their writing coach, and I love the concept underpinning that word, what are some activities and skills you have them engage in to make them better writers? Mm -hmm. Um. One of my favorite lessons that I had as an undergrad student in art was in a ceramics class where the professor had us throw about 50 clay pots on the potter's wheel and then smash them all. And what that taught me at the age of like 19 is not to be so precious about my creations because I'm, you know, he, he, he made us smash every single pot. And there were some I really liked, you know? So I tell my creative writing students that, and then we do an exercise where they bring printouts of their poems and they have to chop them up and throw all their pieces of their poems into a little pile on their desks and they can trade pieces with each other. They can tape them down. They can take Sharpie markers and black things out. And they have to, at the end of class, have recreated at least two or three poems out of whatever it was they actually brought in with them. Um, it's so fun. And they always end up saying it's one of their favorites, their favorite workshops at the end of the semester. And then we hang everything on the blackboard and walk around and look at them. Yeah, and, yeah. And that, that business of walking around, you're reminding me of the writing project because there's that one skill where you, you know, you paste everything up. I mean, you post everything and then we walk around, um, you know, talking to, to ourselves and to each other about yeah. what we're exploring, but there's got to be something there, yeah. you know. And that's what's so beautiful, beautiful about this activity. I think I think there are a lot of teachers who are listening to this and and uh, watching this 
who will appreciate doing that activity because it's, it's very, doable, very, do and it's fun. It's very doable. Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. So, my dear, in closing, <laughs> yes. May May I ask you what inspires you to write, to teach, to make art? Yeah. You know, um, life is hard and. I often think that as beautiful as this planet is, there's also a lot of suffering here. And it's um, whatever we're doing here while, while we're on this planet, we're learning lots of lessons. And for me, poetry and art have always been a way to make sense of things, to find meaning, to um, connect with others across time, to help me navigate my way. Um, even as a, as a teenager, I remember reading Virginia Woolf and just feeling like, oh, someone understands me, you know, or, um, I loved Emily Dickinson as a 15 year old. And, and now, you know, I, I'll discover new authors. I've, I've been into a lot of European poetry lately and, um, and some poetry from like the Gaza Strip and, you know, this the kind of conflict between Palestine and Israel and blah, blah. And I'm reading this and I'm, it just, it, it helps me to talk, if you will, to other writers and artists throughout the history of humanity, because it makes me feel less alone. That's beautiful. And I, yeah, and I, I hope that like through teaching and, and through whatever little bits of art and writing I can create that maybe I help someone else. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good way to put that. I mean, because you're, you're communicating yourself. I think, um, also, one of the things that I keep finding that, that I get inspired as a writer is the fact I become inspired as a writer because there's also craft. You know, yeah. I mean, just by reading, uh, I'm, I'm working on fantasy now and I'm just reading other fantasists and to see how they create that other world without bumbling through it, you know, is, is very encouraging. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, and I, but I, but I do believe that we do become uh, enlightened by other writers and our lives are enriched in such a way that and I like the way you said it, I feel less alone. It's mm -hmm. true. Because we can sometimes, even in the midst of being with a partner, being around other people, being around our students, sometimes we feel very isolated. Um, and so it's nice. We we need to, you know, we need to awaken ourselves to good literature can can the one the one we're working on to write and also the what we're reading. Uh, your poem, to end with your poem. Dear vaccine is obviously timely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am so honored. Um, well, to be here today, obviously, I'm just absolutely thrilled. So thank you for having me. Um, and, I, and I'm also honored to have this um, poem. It's uh, part of a project with the Wick Poetry Center. There's some wonderful people up there um, doing extremely good work, work in the world uh, at Wick, and they're publishing a book coming out um, this winter, I think this winter, late this spring, that is um, responses by poets around the world thinking about the pandemic. Um, and I'm just really excited to be a part of that collection. So this, isn't, this has not hit print yet, um, but it will be coming out later this year. Um, dear Vaccine. Dear Vaccine, give back the wobbly table at the front of my physical classroom, where students and I broke bread, read a braided essay as snow fell out our window. Let elders more time to speak in Dine and Micmac and Haida, voices not muted by hospital glass, but heard laughing shoulder to shoulder. Grant us the perfume of a crowded opera the useful liberty of shared work, the sacred plume of chalk dust, sawdust, pollen, dandelion butter on our naked noses. Allow us one more view from a 747, cheek pressed to glass to see the Rockies beneath a sherbet strata of pink. And my second hand quilted purse? I'd like to carry its bright paisley back out into the world, dive deep into its pockets for a shining dime when a stranger can't find their own. Let us, O oh vaccine, share life's brief and brimming cup, past hand to hand to hand. Yeah, yeah. What, what we've lost, but there's hope, isn't there? That those last lines, you know, there, there will be, you know, from the wobbly desk 
you know, to, to the promise, you know, and we're, we're all praying for it. I, so folks, <laughs> for more information about Jessica's career, her outreach and her projects, her website, and I think I'll ask um, to have this posted so because it's a little complicated, but it's naea.digication.com slash Jessica underscore Jones slash welcome. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> on her website, on her website, uh, she welcomes visitors into her studio where they find examples of her artwork and her exhibitions. Visitors can also see endearing photos of her students and other participants in various schools and programs and at her residencies. Also, note the link there to the collection of poetry from which she just read. Her students wrote during her residency at the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, www.dayinthewoods.blogspot.com. You'll soon find a recording of our interview in the media section of my website, anthonymanabooks.com, at Writers on Writing, Podbean, Podcast. A link will also be available in the video, uh, to a video in our, um, com our, our conversation in youtube.com. Jessica, thank you so much. You're uh, so spending precious time with me and our listeners, because I know you're in, the, you're, at, you're in a semester right now and you've got a lot on your mind. Our listeners and viewers, it's been a great pleasure uh, to hear you, uh, to not to only talk about your experiences, but also your outreach. That's the big thing for me is how you take that sense of diversity and social justice and just bring it out, you know, all over the place. And um, I just think that, uh, people will want to know more about you. And also your, your book of poetry, which is available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble and directly from finishing, there we go, Bitterroot, finishinglinepress.com. Thank you so much. And it's, it's, been, um, it's been a total pleasure. And I hope we stay in touch. <laughs> Me too. I was just going to say, I think we should have coffee or another Zoom or phone call sometime. Yeah, let's do yeah, let's, 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 I'd love that. Man, I, I would love it too. And so I wish you so much luck in this semester. Having gone through that so many years of my life, I understand how a little jittery we are at the beginning, but then it all comes together so beautifully. So do take care of yourself, be safe, and be happy. Thank you so much, Jessica. So much. Thank you bye -bye. for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.